In this video, we're going to talk about the quantity theory of money that illustrates a connection between money supply and nominal variables like price and inflation and nominal interest rates. The quantity theory of money simply states that the quantity of money determines the value of money and prices around the economy. It was developed by 18th century philosopher David Hume and the classical economist and more recently has been advocated by Nobel Prize laureate Milton Friedman. To make this idea a little bit more rigorous and understand what is involved, we're going to employ a supply and demand diagram and then an equilibrium equation. The classical dichotomy is the theoretical separation of nominal and real variables. That means that monetary developments affect nominal variables, but not real variables. For example, if the central bank doubles the money supply, all prices and nominal variables will double, but all real variables would remain constant. In particular, suppose that initially the price of a movie is $15 and the price of pizza is 10. The real price of pizza then calculated as the ratio between the price of a movie to the price of a pizza is one and a half pizzas per movie. That means you have to give up one movie to get 1.5 pizzas. Now suppose that we double all nominal prices. So movies are now $30 and pizzas are 20. Doing the same calculation, you see that the relative price of pizzas remains unchanged. The result that relative prices remain the same after changes in nominal variables is called money neutrality. It applies to real wages too. Even when wages and prices double, the quantity of labor supplied and demanded doesn't change. So real wages and employment should not change either. This result of course can be expanded to include all factors of production. Since factor markets remain the same after a monetary change, real output remains constant. This description of the economy is extreme. We know that changes in prices can have real effects in the economy, but data suggests that in the long run, the classical dichotomy is a great description of the interaction between nominal and real variables. The argument is that money is the measuring stick of the economy, but changes from inches to centimeters doesn't change how tall you are. It may create confusion or disagreement in the short run, but eventually reality is reality. Okay, now to formalize the quantity theory of money, let's first define the value of money. We will use the uppercase P for the price level, which could be measured by any of our favorite price indices. The value of $1 is going to be the amount of goods and services it can buy. If we wanted to measure um, the value of money in candy bars, the price of a candy bar is two dollars then the value of one dollar is one half of a candy bar similarly speaking if the price of the candy bar is three dollars then the value of one dollar is one third of a candy bar hence the value of money is one over the price level from this relationship we get the result that inflation drives down the value of money okay so let's analyze a money supply and demand diagram so let's start with the axes. On the left hand side, there's the price of value or of money. On the right hand side is the price level. They go in opposite directions. So as prices fall, the value of money increases. Money demand refers to how much wealth people want to hold in liquid form. Holding real income constant and increasing the overall level of prices reduces the value of money. So more money is required to buy goods and services, increasing the quantity of money demanded. Rising prices lower the value of money, showing this negative relationship between the value of money and the quantity of money demanded. On the other hand, money supply in the real world is determined by the Fed, 
the banking system, and consumers. However, and for this model, to make things simpler, let's assume that the Fed precisely controls the money supply and sets it at some fixed amount. Graphically, that means a perfectly inelastic supply curve or a vertical line. And you know where we are going. The intersection of demand and supply is the equilibrium in this market. Price adjusts to equate the quantity of money demanded with its supply. So let's think about two cases to illustrate how we get to the equilibrium. Let's think about a surplus of money. Let's suppose that the value of money was 3 fourths or that the price level was 1.3. At that point, quantity demanded is well below the quantity supplied and we have a surplus of money. In this case, people bid the price of goods and services, increasing prices until we reach equilibrium. Just like any downward pressure in any market, the demand and supply diagram for money illustrates how we can get to the equilibrium value of money in one half and a price level of two. Now let's think about a shortage. In the case of a shortage, Let's say that the price level is equal to four uh, and the value of money is one fourth. The quantity uh, supplied of money is well below the quantity demanded and we have a shortage. Now, because there's not enough money to conduct our transactions, households are not going to purchase all the stock available of goods and services and firms are going to start uh, having sales and reducing their prices and that is going to put upward pressure on the value of money increasing it back to the equilibrium of one half resulting in a price level of two now that you understand how we reach equilibrium let's suppose that the fed increases the money supply from MS1 to MS2. I would like you to pause this video and using your understanding, predict what's going to happen to prices in the economy. All right, thank you. Um, so initially there is a surplus of money that's going to push prices up and reduce the value of money. The new equilibrium B is going to be a place with the higher level of prices and a lower level of the value of money. Now that we understand the connection between the quantity of money and the price level, let's think about it from a different perspective, the perspective of a whole country. On the left hand side, of this equation, you have the price level multiplied by real GDP. And we know what that is. Those two together are nominal GDP. Now, what is in the right hand side? On the right hand side, you have the velocity of money times uh, the money stock. But how exactly can we interpret this relationship? Now you see, every transaction recorded in nominal GDP has a monetary counterpart. This equation tells us that the stock of money in the economy must have changed hands enough time to have bought everything measured in nominal GDP. To see this more clearly, let's think about a simple economy. One where the only good produced and sold is pizza. Suppose that in 2018, the total production of pizzas was 3,000. Each pizza sold for $10. Nominal GDP, therefore, or the market value of all these pizzas is $30,000. Now, if there was only $10,000 in the money stock, how did all those transactions happen? Well, it must be that each dollar got used in an average of three transactions. 
And that's exactly what velocity of money is. It's the speed at which the average dollar circulates in the economy. So the right hand side of this equation is telling us the nominal GDP must have a counterpart. And that is the amount of dollars that get used in transactions during the same period of time. Now let's go more deeply into this concept of velocity. Now surprisingly, the data shows that velocity is roughly constant. In this graph, you see that M2 and nominal GDP grow closely together. Now it is definitely not a one-to-one -one relationship, but it illustrates the interesting fact that velocity is roughly constant across time. So throughout the rest of the video, let's assume the velocity is constant. Now let's use our understanding of the quantity equation. Let's think about one good economy, corn. This economy has enough labor, capital, and land to produce 800 bushels of corn. Assume that velocity is constant. Now the data tells us that in 2014, the money supply was 2000 and the price level was $5 per bushel. I want you to compute nominal GDP and velocity in 2014. Now please sign in to Top Hat and answer this question there. Thank you for submitting your answers on Top Hat. Now, let's do some calculations. Well, nominal GDP is prices times real GDP. Now we know that prices in this case are $5 per bushel and there were 800 bushels of corn in 2014 for a nominal GDP value of $4,000. Now having that information, we can calculate velocity. Velocity in this case is two. What that means is that the average um, dollar had to be participant in two transactions in 2014. Now, it's great that we know how to use the quantity equation, uh, but economists are not so interested in finding the value of velocity as they are of thinking about how these variables change over time. In particular, the relationship between prices and the money supply, which is what we were after. So let's use this equation. In fact, it's approximation and percentage changes to understand that relationship. So using our fancy uh, percentage change trick, we can transform this equation into its percentage change counterpart. And that is that the percentage change in the money supply plus the percentage change in velocity equals the percentage change in prices plus the percentage change in real GDP. Now again, we were interested in the relationship between prices and the money supply. So let's solve for the percentage change in prices. That should be equal to the percentage change in money supply plus the percentage change in velocity divided by the percentage change in real GDP. Now we have names for all of these, uh, but before I do that, let me then rem remind you that we're assuming that velocity is constant. So that percentage change is zero. So from this, we know that then inflation or the growth of prices over time is equal to the growth of money the money supply divided by economic growth. Now, if we assume that there is no economic growth um, at any given point, then we can clearly see that inflation is equal to the growth of the money supply. So if the Fed were to increase the money stock, that will mean that we will get inflation. Now, this equation is incredibly important to our understanding of the relationship between the money supply and inflation. And it shows the basic result that we got using the money supply and money demand diagram. So let's use it. In this active learning exercise, 
we're going to take the same one good economy as before and the economy only produces corn again the economy has enough labor capital and land to produce 800 bushels of corn again assume velocity is constant in 2014 the money supply was two thousand dollars and prices were five dollars per bushel now for the next year 2015 the fed increases the money supply by five percent to 2100 I want you to A, compute the 2015 values of nominal GDP and prices, compute the inflation rate for 2014 and 2015, and then I want you to think about what happens uh, with economic growth. So suppose that technological progress causes um, Y, real GDP, to increase to 824 in 2015. I want you to compute the 2014 to 2015 inflation rate. Please submit all your answers on Top Hat and we will review this exercise during our class time.